All year, I'm the interim grad dean, and I'm really thrilled to invite this panel to our school tonight. Um, this distinguished panel of, of art professionals from all over the world. This is a third in a series that we've had over the past three years of towards an art, uh, anti-racist art ecosystem. Um, it was generously funded by Hindman Auction. And what it was was kind of one of our attempts to discuss what was started in the summer after the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, which was that we all kind of started to look at the systems that we belong to and um, kind of discuss the white supremacism of those institutions and discuss what the art world as a whole could do. And so this is the culminating panel of what was first a local Chicago discussion, the second one was a national discussion, and now this will be a global discussion. I'm really excited about this one too because it gives us the opportunity to talk about even the term anti-racism, what it means when it becomes exported throughout the world, and some of you know those nuances and um, non-nuances, as it were. So it's in this spirit too that I want to offer one of our um, anti-racist uh, committee, school committees, uh, recommendations, which was to give a land acknowledgement before each public event. Um, so this, the school, the city, is all situated on the unceded homelands of many Native and Indigenous peoples, including uh, the Odawa, the Ojibwe, and the Motawami. Sorry, I'm going to change my paper. So. So these communities are still with us, obviously, and we kind of declare our solidarity with them and um, our willingness to work with uh, Native people in the city and to try to work to these um, common goals. So um, we're grateful for being hosted by them. We're grateful for um, all of the administrative support that Jeff Ward and others on my team at the school offered. and. Um, and I want to introduce our moderator for tonight, Magdalena Moskalovich, who is a, an art historian, a curator, um, also in a global context, coming from um, a, a background of Eastern European and post-socialist cultures. So Magda will be able to introduce each of our guests tonight. Um, and I think what she's gonna be able to offer us is uh, kind of a view that that pivots and is able to take into account um, um, all of the positions that our panelists will represent tonight. So I will invite all of our panelists up to the stage, including Magda, and please, please w join me in welcoming them to the stage. Thank you, Delinda. Hi, everyone. Hello to our panelists. It is my pleasure to introduce you and to question you today. Um, starting with Ugojuku Smovnzewi, who is an artist, art historian, and the curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, at MoMA, he leads Afri CMAP Africa Group. CMAP is MoMA's um, global research initiative. Um, and she also, he also works on collection acquisitions and exhibitions. Prior to joining MoMA in 2019, um, Smooth was the curator of African art at the Cleveland Museum of Art, as well as Dartmouth College's Hood Museum of Art. And he curated a number of exhibitions, including um, co-curating the Dakar Biennial in Senegal in 2014, as well as Shanghai Biennial in 2016-17. And among his books are Dakar, the Biennial of Dakar, the Biennale of Dakar, excuse me, and the Making of Contemporary African Art that came out of Routledge, Routledge 2020. Welcome. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Zoe Butt, who is a curator and a writer who lives and works between Chiang Mai, Thailand, and Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, although currently she's also visiting um, Chicago. Oh, 
where she teaches at the University of Chicago. Her practice focuses on fostering dialogue among cultures of the globalizing South. Um, after nearly two decades of directing artists' initiated art infrastructures and during ideological censorship and surveillance in first China and then Vietnam, she founded Intangible Institute in Thailand in 2022. Uh, previously, she was the artistic director at the Factory Contemporary Art Center in Ho Chi Minh City and also held uh, curatorial positions in Beijing, in Brisbane, uh, co curated at the Sharia by, uh, Sharja Biennial, excuse me, and was involved in a number of educational programs and artistic productions focused on interdisciplinary expertise from across the global south. She also very recently was awarded a PhD um, in art history. No? What is your PhD in? I'm going to say art history then. Congratulations and welcome. <laughs> Next to Zoe is Gio Swaby, who is a Bahamian interdisciplinary visual artist who is based in Ontario, Canada, but she's visiting in Chicago because she has an exhibition that just opened at the Art Institute of Chicago across the street. Congratulations. <laughs> Gia is known for her textile portraits that explore and celebrate blackness, so I invite everyone to go and see her work at the museum. Um, and then we have Vipash Purchianon. I'm really trying here. Um, who is an independent curator based in Bangkok. He is a alum of SAIC. He studied here in the dual degree art history and arts administration and policy, the class of 2020, 2012, excuse me. So we're very happy to have you back, Vipash. Um, Vipash is a lecturer at the Department of Art History in Silpakorn University. Uh, his curatorial projects were presented in Chicago, in Kuala Lumpur, in Bangkok, Hanoi, um, and other places. He was assistant curator for the first Thailand Biennial in 2018 and a co-curator of the second Thailand Biennial in 2021. He is also a co-founder of Waiting You Curator Lab in Bangkok. Welcome. And last but not least, we have Victoria Northorn, who is the director of the Museo d'Arte Moderno de Buenos Aires, where she has served since 12, 2013, so 10 years now. Um, previously, she worked as an independent curator and curated a number of shows and biennials, including the biennial in Pontevedra in Spain, in Cali in Colombia, in Porto Alegre in Brazil, and also in Lyon, France. Uh, during her tenure at the Museo d'Arte Moderno, the museum has undergone a deep process of development that has involved doubling its exhibition spaces, presenting more than 100 exhibitions, publishing 50 bilingual publications, and escalating its various educational programs to involve as many as 7,000 teachers a year, um, and achieving recognition for its mental health and accessibility programs. Since 2019, Victoria has served, has been active on um, board member of CIMAM. CIMAM is the International Committee of Museums and Collections of Modern Art. And in fact, the museum will, held, uh, will hold uh, this annual CIMAM's conference, the 55th annual CIMAM conference this year in November in Buenos Aires. Welcome, Victoria. Okay, so our conversation today is toward an anti-racist art ecosystem. Um, and the word anti-racist itself, I think, calls for some kind of uh, explanation or maybe conversation around, because there are a lot of words that are adjacent and somewhat similar or similarly used by art institutions, museums, pedagogical institutions like ours, including um, diversity, including inclusion, including equity. I have also heard belonging being used in that context. So essentially different type of nomenclature used for what we would 
referred to maybe more broadly as issues of social justice, including racial justice. Um, how useful do you think this term really is? Is this the term that you use and you see used? Is it useful? Is it helpful? Is it detrimental? Let's, I just want to brainstorm the term a bit before we go into talking how to you know, make the art world actually anti-racist. And this is an open question. You can start wherever you want. I mean, whoever wants to start. Victoria, I see you want to start. Hello, hello. good, thank you. Well, th thank you for having me. I feel very honored in such fantastic company. Thank you, Magdalena, for moderating all of us. And thank you, Jeff. And Linda. And I'm not a musician. <laughs> it might be interfering with the others. Can we turn off the others, maybe? Okay. Let's see now. Yeah. Good. Better. <laughs> um, Thank you, Delinda, for the invitation as well, and the Art Institute for having me. I, I feel very honored. Um, I'm not a theorist. <laughs> this is, I'm a person that comes from practice. Um, so since I don't feel totally comfortable with words, I'm married to a writer who's totally comfortable with words. I did write for myself, since this is a, a sensitive topic, and English is not my first language, perhaps, I will read and then everybody will be much better off free without texts, <laughs> um, if, if you would forgive me. So um, I was very much uh, called by this, uh, your first proposal, Magda, to, to define the terms and to think about the terms that we use. And I think this is uh, profoundly important um, to understand where we, where we stand in, diver, uh, in regards to diverse, uh, to the diverse terminologies. And I wrote this um, that I hope you follow me if possible. My personal stance is that racism, sexism, xenophobia, and class discrimination are different and specific ways of justifying whether intellectual, intellectually or emotionally, consciously or unconsciously, through discourse or practice, inequality, injustice, and domination. If I live and I work in a society where such social differences are aligned with what are perceived as racial differences, I will inevit inevitably harbor racist ideas and feelings or participate in practices of racial discrimination, active or passive, through speech or silence, justification or indifference, whether I realize it or not. If racism were merely the ideology of some disreputable individuals, it would be fairly easy to erase. Racism is an objective quality of certain forms of social order, and whoever is a beneficiary of such forms of inequality is objectively racist. Now my discomfort with the concept of anti-racism is that in turning any manifestation perceived as racist into an unforgivable crime, it leads me to deny any such manifestations in myself and project them on others. It is always the other one who is racist, not I, and by pointing my finger at them and canceling them, I redeem or even more effectively obliterate my, my participation or complicity in an objectively racist social order. Belonging to a discriminated group is no guarantee against this. And forgive for what I'm going to say. You can always find another group further down the evolutionary scale to discriminate in turn. And I speak here of evolution because the 19th century social Darwinian justification of racism has not been erased, only submerged. So in this very complicated, with this having said this, which is extremely complex, I, as a leader of a major museum in Argentina, prefer to work with an obsession with inclusion, which is, of course, underscored by a search for equity or where, wherever applicable social justice. 
And this obsession with inclusion is only natural as we work in a context of deep economic crisis characterized by 100% of annual infl inflation and where 50% of the population is under the line of poverty and where a large majority of the population does not visit museums. In my view, um, anti-racism is not such a helpful term to lead as it, as it is a term defined in opposition of, and it therefore feeds a, a toxic binary, a polarizing position, the polarizing position that it tries to avoid. So, um, perhaps I'm not sure if this is the moment, but we have worked at the museum with a program that I have brought to the slides, and I'm not going to go through the entire program, just to mention that during the, the pandemic, when we went digitally and when, when, when the crime of uh, George Floyd happened um, in Argentina, there were similar crimes happening at the time. And there was this call to think, where do we stand in the face of this horror that we face every day and that we are not looking at it as profoundly? And therefore, we created a digi digital program that we entitled as a question, am I racist? And we, one of the components of the program was to, we organized it uh, together with the director of the Museum of Anthropology in the Uni National University of Cordoba in Argentina called Fabiola Heredia. I want to give her the credit. as uh, She's a fabulous intellectual and now dear friend. And there is Fabiola over there. And, um, and in this program, we um, we invited we 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 invited uh, Sheila Velker over there to to realize um, uh, an, um, a research uh, how do, a, a, um, I don't know how you call it in English. I'm sorry. Um, uh, one of these uh, polls, uh, not polls. Your survey. survey. Thank you. A survey. Um, on what was the situation of racism in Argentina. And what we found out through this survey is that Argentines recognize that, that there is a very, very high degree of discrimination in a society, but in a very surprising way, 90% of the Argentines consulted identify racism in another person, not in oneself. And that racism, it's not the same racism in all over the world, so the, the globality of the term is something that I would like to question, because racism in the United States is one thing, in Israel it's another thing, in South Africa is another thing, in Argentina is another thing, and in our case, the racism is deeply, has a very deep root in the indigenous genocide that, that is a grounding of our own society. Um, so racism in Argentina, def as defined by this survey, is, is a discrimination first and foremost against class and against pover poverty. So I'm not going to say more, but this is just a bit of data and trying to, to bring the notion of reflection and of dialogue rather than polarization to the floor. Thank you. All right, since, since I have the mic. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so thank you, SAC. It's great to be back. Um, and then uh, I think when, when I'm, I was thinking and preparing for this uh, panels, um, it was interesting because I remember that um, I kind of like directly confront with racism actually here in the States. So it was not it was not something that I was like aware of when I was in Thailand. So so the, as a, a student, as an international student, came here and then need to to live here for for um, couple of years. Then that was like you know um, it became apparent to me. And then um, so but looking back, maybe uh, in Thailand was uh, there was a racism of course, but then maybe it's not as visible. 
So the visibility of, of the race, or what you maybe identified it as a race, is not there. Um, just to go back a little bit, and then maybe just um, talk about the history of Thailand, and then what, and then what I think is might not as visible was that um, in uh, 19, it was it was a kingdom of Siam before, and then if you know, uh, or if you heard of, you might uh, think that it wasn't um, been colonized. And um, but then that uh, was a question also whether it hasn't been colonized or not or is self-colonized, and then there's somebody who would say that it's crypto-colonized, it's been colonized without being known. But then what um, maybe um, one thing that we could uh, see is just to go back to 1940s, 1939, um, uh, when the kingdom of, of Siam was turned into Thailand. And then everyone, they, and then they turn everyone into Thai. So in a way, we can say that we are uh, the artificial race. And then um, after that, the questions of racism became maybe inside out, and then it became uh, the kind of like a critique towards um, what we call Thainess. And then I think um, in terms of that, when you know, after came here, and then. Um, experience with what happened here, then it's very good to you know go back and revisit that again, and then trying to identify or you know going under into the layer of that kind of maybe um, very subtle, you know differences, and then I think that's where we become part of like what I'm I'm interested, I'm, I'm, I'm interesting topics for me for the work. So yeah, let's just leave it there. Okay. Oh, that is loud. Um, hi, uh, my name is Gio Swaby. Thank you so much for having me um, at this talk. It's a true honor and pleasure to be here and to share the stage with such um, incredible folks all working um, in extraordinary ways in their own fields. Um, for me, when I think of the term anti-racist, I'm thinking of you know my own experiences. Um, I'm born and raised in the Bahamas, and that's kind of my grounding for an understanding of uh, my own race and what, what that means to me and how it affects my life coming from a majority black country uh, with a very strong colonial history as well. Um, and, you know, for me, what I experienced most growing up was this experience of colorism um, can you know the consideration of how even within this community of blackness there exists a an imposed hierarchy um, you hear things like you know wanting to have a, a, a mothers wishing for a baby with a lighter skin or um, thinking about hair texture and how that kind of affects the way that you're received and how people uh, will treat you. It, you don't begin as neutral. Um, there's always context. Um, so I took, so I had that experience and then I moved to Canada which, and into Vancouver, which the population of black folks there is very small, less than less than 2%. So it was a complete shift for me in understanding, in understanding race and how, um, you know, my understanding of the world as a black woman shifts depending on uh, where I am and even who I'm with. Um, so hearing the term in anti-racism and my understanding of it is always contextual. I think it's important to know more. I always will have more questions if, especially within institutions that use that framework and label, how do we get there? Um, 
what systems are in place to kind to move this work forward. Um, how are we creating visibility in considerations of museum spaces uh, for not just artists of color, but also staff in this space? Um, who is who decides what is shown and what is not shown? Um, and I think that, um, like I said, there's always the additional questions that come that come into my mind when I hear the term. So for me, it doesn't just exist on its own, but within a framework of understanding how to uh, work toward this goal of achievement. Uh, thank you to SAIC for the chance to be here. For me, the word anti-racism is not productive for me and my own journey. As a Chinese-British Aussie, growing up in a small town, one of two families of color, I came very early on to understand that cosmopolitanism and urbanism play a huge role in how we relate to race. And I've lived in some cities that are not the presumed centers of the world. And so the discussions of inside and out, us versus them, invisible versus visible, has different parameters and different contexts that in my mind are very healthy because I think the world needs complicating away from dualisms between racism and anti-racism and to really embrace pluralism and a sense of sensorial response to the world. And if we're here to think about the role of anti-racism in a global art world, I would say that a really big issue we have is the prominence of sight in how we value an artwork, in how we value largely what we can only see instead of what we can hear, what we can taste, what we can feel. And for me, I think the world needs to be given that multiplicity. So in the worlds that I like to create and support, I don't want to deny that certain contexts, as Victoria has outlined, are in need of having this conversation. And I think in the States, that's quite clear. But in my world and in the journey that I'm on, I would like that conversation to be more about acceptance and respect. I'll leave it there. Hello. So I want to also offer my thanks to the organizers of this event, Belinda, Jeff, uh, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Magdalena, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be um, in conversation with a distinguished group of people, uh, people that I admire. And I will say that um, the various comments uh, uh, from Victoria all the way to Zoe, sort of, they all capture the essence of the way in which we think about um, anti-racism, you know, um, and I think uh, Zoe makes a very valid point that um, that the anti is placed as an ob the anti-racism is placed as an obverse to racism, you know, and that in itself can either be useful or it's also and be it's also being emptied of of meaning uh, in that sense um, because it becomes a certain binary around which we uh, do the business we do in the art world and. Um, it offers a structure uh, to, to think through how institutions work, but it doesn't necessarily offer solutions because it doesn't go to the heart of um, um, the inst institutionalized structures that are what we call the protocols that allow us to do the business we do um, in the art world or even in the larger world, you know? And so when I think about um, anti-racism, you know, um, what comes to my mind is, how can we 
can we operationalize restorative justice as opposed to All right. So, so how can we op <laughs> operationalize re uh, so, uh, restorative justice? Because that in itself allows you to think about um, uh, the, different, the different registers of um, historical baggage around the term racism, you know, and then the willingness to be accountable and also willingness to, to, um, to, uh, to be very active in really thinking through how to offer um, some form of um, um, restorative justice, basically. You know, so that's, that's what, have, what, what comes to my mind when I think about it. Um, um, because restorative justice in itself, it's uh, the idea of equity in the real, equity in the real sense of it is also inscribed within it. And um, I'll leave it at that. I will continue to talk. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to pick it up at solutions then, since this is where we landed. But it seems like we all agree that the term, whether we're going to call it anti-racism or inclusion, right, or respect and acceptance, is very context specific and it works differently in different places. Um, so speaking of solutions and keeping those nuances in mind, you also, you both come from different backgrounds and actually have different roles in the art world, right? Some of you represent large collecting institutions that are seen as like powerful um, institutions in the art world. Some of you work independently. Some of you have also your own uh, artistic practice. So I am wondering if you could speak to the solutions that you think either you can provide or people in similar roles to you can provide to this issue, whether we call it the issue of racism or of injustice of, uh, uh, you know, social or racial um, injustice. Um, and again, whoever would like to start. Do you want to start? Sure, yes. Um. Okay, these mics are a struggle today. <laughs> We're getting through it. Um, so for me, as an artist, the way that um, that I've kind of formed that solution is first understanding that my power and strength as an artist is being able to work from my own unique perspective of uh, my lived experience of being a black woman, being from the Bahamas in that Caribbean context, being an immigrant now living in Canada, and um, and uh, having those considerations as a part of my work. Um, wanting to present my story and uh, through, the, through the lens of portraiture as an opportunity for people who perhaps can have some kind of connection or recognize some similarities in that experience. Um, for me, my practice is certainly centered on a celebration of blackness and womanhood. Through my work, I want to create spaces of comfort. I want to create spaces that feel warm, welcoming, that kind of remove some of that intimidation of uh, the museum space or the gal gallery space where uh, uh, black folks and uh, a lot of people of color have been historically excluded. How do I create a space within that framework that does feel welcoming, um, that is accessible? And that's one of the reasons I work with textile and that I work with portraiture is because textiles, they're such a familiar material. It's something that we always come, we come into contact with daily, all throughout our lives. Um, from the moment that we're born. And I think it breaks down some of those barriers to access, especially I'm thinking of people like me that you know did not grow up going to museums, did not grow up going to art galleries. How do I create access points in my work? Um, and how do I kind of create this community within these spaces. 
So it's certainly about the representation of blackness in, in the portraits of, uh, you know, immortalizing myself, my friends, and my family through my work, but also creating those moments of reflection when people can walk into the space and see a version of themselves, someone that they love. Um, so it's, it's about generating that connection. That's where, that's where I work from in, you know, figuring out my contribution and, and my place in this. Can I, can I jump in? Um, so I, I, did, I didn't say a little bit about my background. I, I'm, I'm an immigrant, um, but now I'm an American citizen. So I've been in, in the US for 16 years now, 15, 16 years. Um, I started off as an artist and then ultimately um, uh, became a museum curator. But one of the things that animated my, my life uh, prior to the US, so when I was still very much a practicing artist, uh, one of the things that I really struggled with in the very beginning was how to think about inclusion and exclusion. And I, I know I explain this because it basically leads me into the kind of work I do today. Um, so I was involved in organizing a very tiny biennial in Nigeria, which I know a lot of people don't know about. Um, it's called the Africa Heritage Biennial. And um, so we, we would make biennials on shoestring budgets. You know, I would put together money and then invite folks to come to the biennial. And then you hear that artists are all going to this big biennial in Senegal, or going to this big biennial in Johannesburg, or in Cairo, or in Venice, you know? And, I, and we wondered, why didn't we, why we're not getting this crowd to come to our tiny biennial, you know? So this is where you begin to understand sort of the very insidious politics within the art world, how, how, how the economics of what we do in the art world and how that is tied to power and, and, and access, you know? So I became interested in how one gets included in global conversations so get, or get excluded uh, out of it. And you may say that my journey since then has taken me from the periphery to the center of that conversation. Now I work at MoMA, you know, and my previous experience um, at Dartmouth once really uh, showed me in very stark terms what the stakes are. So. I put together a show on weapons, weapons, um, and the show in itself was to look at the colonial histories surrounding weapons vis-a-vis -vis, um, the practice of uh, fraternity at Dartmouth, you know, because it's, it has a very strong culture there. And uh, it was during the Obama presidency, and there was this Obama Mandela initiative called the Yali Fellowship that brought folks from, from Africa. And so we had this uh, group of young, 20 people uh, from, there were about 50, sorry, but from different parts of the continent that came to Dartmouth and I was walking them through the exhibition, you know, they were all excited. Someone would say this is some kind of, uh, this is a medicinal bundle that I rec recognize from childhood uh, because my grandmother was, would talk about how it's, it's sort of a, a love portion. And someone would say, I recognize this Zulu spear from, 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 from uh, South Africa. And then, but I realized that one lady out of the lot was not interested in, in the conversation. You know, she, was, she didn't say anything, you know. I was worried because I felt I was not communicating. I, it was at the end of a session where we were having a conversation with, with K through 12 teachers. And basically the conversation was about what are the stereotypes of Africa in the American um, consciousness or, or media and vis-a-vis -vis the stereotype of America in the African consciousness. And out of the blues, this lady said, um, you know, I couldn't see myself in your show. You know, she's from Cape Verde. And she said, there's this general sense that once it's an African show, that I'm, I should have act, I understand what is going on. You know, but she was not able to find herself in the show because there was no object from Cape Verde included in the show. And that in itself uh, was a moment of enlightenment. You know, that even within um, uh, 
so-called communities, you know, that there's also a hierarchy of what is important within even our own communities, you know, that one can also be excluded or included even within the communities, not, not outside of the community. And so when you begin to think about the so-called anti-racism, you begin to understand how the different registers in which it operates. So for, for me, that was um, a, t a teachable moment, you know? And so whenever I make a show, I mean, what, one of the things that guide my activities in the, in the museum is I always say if someone from elsewhere who is not from this context comes into my exhibition, would that person be able to see herself, themselves, himself in that show? You know, so for that me, for me that sort of it's, that became sort of my mantra. You know, I want to make I want to I want to make a show that allows people to to have a sense of ownership of that show, and it doesn't matter where you are from the world. But once you walk into my show, you are able to have a sense of participation. You know, you are able to see yourself, be able to engage with that exhibition, and to do that means that you're you're, you're to be able to do that successfully, even with a, an institution such as my institution or institution of similar uh, likes, uh, you should be able to in, in find ways of going against the grain of what, what the institutionalized protocols are because those protocols in themselves are where the work, the work we should be doing reside, basically. So how has my work revealed a certain hierarchy of stereotypes of race and, dare I say, exotification of race? The first comes from when I was working in Beijing and I was the head of international programs for a space called Long March Project. And I'd found the opportunity to send three Chinese artists to Southeast Asia, two to Jakarta, and one to Kuala Lumpur. Really well paid, well looked after, facilities incredibly good. And I couldn't find a single Chinese artist willing to go. And when I asked where would they prefer to go, Berlin, Paris, London, or New York. And as a consequence, my boss at the time said, please redirect your energies upstairs. And I thought, interesting. I shouldn't be surprised, but when I found myself with one of these Chinese artists, I was trying to get to go to Indonesia, we got drunk one night, and I asked him, why did you refuse that invitation? And he replies by saying, why on earth would I be interested in the rear of the vanguard? And I thought that was a really interesting way of showing Chinese racism. A second story from my time of working in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, and I used to be the director of an artist-run space called San Art. And it was a visit from a particular American institution that collects. I'm not going to name names. And uh, we made sure that the, the two floors of our little center had art from a number of different artists across the country that had previously worked with us. And I gave a tour, I described the works, and this group of people who were on a trip to buy art showed no interest. They were looking at their watches. You could, body language was clear. They want to leave, so I thought, okay, fine. And as they're walking out the door, the head of the little group says, Zoe, would you mind sharing a little bit about censorship in Vietnam? For those of you in this crowd who may not know, Vietnam is a highly censored cultural community. It is very, very hard to be an artist. You have to be vetted by the authorities to show your work, and the system of censorship is rife. It is incredibly hard to be honest as an artist in Vietnam. So I explained a little bit more detail about the landscape and they wanted me to point out which works in the show on view had been censored. By the end of the visit, all those works had sold. Which 
shows the role of exotifying the stereotypes of cultures from a purchasing institution in the West in the art world. And that experience for me has been repeated over and over again. I have many more experiences, but we must hear from our lovely other guests. Okay, so I, I just gonna maybe share also like um, comparing to Vietnam, Thailand is a tourist city, and it's a tourist countries. And then um, we also uh, receive a lot of art tourists. Uh, so art tourism, um, one of the thing that um, I did was, you know, assistant curator for um, Thailand Biennale and was, was in Grabi. So it's like, you know, like next to it is the PP Islands. And then, um, so we need to do like, you know, a programming for um, these Thailand Biennale things. And then, um, but then, well, you know, what, what I learned in terms of like going through that experience also, um, the way to maybe not at the anti-racist, but problematize, you know, the uniform notion of, of certain kind of maybe race. Uh, was not um, in terms of approach was not to do another kind of like um, to do the international international exhibition and international exchange. I think that's very important. But then how you do it? Um, the the worst possible thing was to organize another kind of art tourism. So people drop by and then do it, um, or, or maybe just loan the work and then um, just come and do this thing and then just disappear. And then that seemed to be experienced that very similar to tourists going to Grabi. Um, when we worked in Grabi, we knew that there were like a lot more con conformed communities that uh, maybe they are not uh, related to the, the Biennale that we did. So, so we try to reach out with, uh, you, and then work with international artists. But then what I found the most important thing in approaching working with this was to give them more time, to give artists more time, to give them more time to, to be able to exchange, to you know, like maybe dissolve certain kind of notions that people see in, in there. So maybe showing you since it's, all, it's, it's up here, so one of the work that we did um, can you go back a little bit to this one, please? Yes. Uh, this is a work that we did together with uh, Indonesian artists, uh, actually Dutch Indonesian artist, um, Mela Jasma. So what she did was to work with uh, these communities in Goklang, which is like really close community, not related so much with the tourism. And then they will find that um, during the process of what I said uh, earlier about like becoming Thai, then uh, the community needs to throw away their stems uh, in the practice of batik because they thought that, because they thought that batik is not Thai. Batik is a you know certain kind of like fabri fa fabrics that may be related to more like Malaysian Indonesian uh, traditions. So they need to throw away all of that stems during that times. Um, so she uh, absolutely uh, one of the family decided not to throw away. So they kept it for self for like 40 years. And then um, with, the art, with the help of the artist, they finally be able to um, produce, you know, reproduce this and then um, work together into the suit. Um, but then the suit was uh, performed this way in the port um, that we throw the suit into, into the water and then you can, you know, act of retrieving that history. Um, just to thinking a little bit more is mean that, you know, like I, I think one way of tackling this is also the time together that we didn't have after the pandemic. So most of, um, I think, f at least for Thailand right now, most of the um, residency disappear. And then we somehow need to, I'm not sure if we can, you know, trying to get that back. So that can be a certain kind of way in which we can um, come together without this kind of, you know, um, constructed boundaries that we had. So, yeah, so that's maybe my approach. Okay. 
Hello. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I, a lot has been said, so I, I just want to add something quite practical on the term of, of roles. Um, I occupy a seat in the board of CIMAM, which is this international organization of museum professionals, of museum of professionals dedicated to modern and contemporary art, both working in institutions or independent. And I consider that an enormous responsibility. Um, and in that way, I wanted to mention uh, perhaps just three recent uh, recent activity in that in that board one of them is uh, having changed last year uh, the membership fees for museum professionals around the world uh, simam used to have a flat membership fee of 30 euros which here in the united states might seem very little but when you go to a place like argentina 30 euros could be like 10% of your salary as a museum curator, perhaps. So um, a very complicated and fragile economic situation. And we managed to uh, go by a system of a membership fees that is in accordance to the gross domestic product of the different countries. Um, on another note, we are organizing our next conference, uh, which is based for the first time in 55 years on the social function of museums. So I take this opportunity, forgive me, to invite everybody <laughs> to Buenos Aires on November 9 to 11 with the first conference to have a simultaneous translation English-Spanish and the first one to offer childcare as well. And uh, within that, a, w a place that I work with, with a heart very much invested in it um, is a, a body called Museum Watch that I really would like to invite you to, to look at closely at, at what we try to do there, which is try to, to advocate for the possibility to exercise best practices for, both for institutions and for individuals. And in the context of this panel, I just want to mention something that I think needs to be mentioned however challenging, and is um, the mechanisms of cancel culture that are in place every time more in museums around the world. And to do a call, if I may, um, to incentivate institutions to work through the challenges that might arise rather than to position themselves in situations of polarization and of cancellation um, so as to transform a paralyzing culture of cancellation into a constructive framework for fostering a true forum uh, for the debate of ideas that can lead to the development of knowledge and of civic self-awareness. And I also think it is an important time to invite institutions around the world to severely limit the use of non-disclosure agree agreements that are silencing tools that may condemn uh, professionals that are accused of racism, sometimes with a justification, sometimes not. And they are condemned, whether with a valid motive or not, without the possibility of an apology to a social and professional death, as Doris Salcedo, a Colombian artist, has mentioned once. So, so to reflect of the tools that we have as museum leaders to go through the challenges that we inevitably, inevitably will go through and face in societies that are born out of a construction of a nation state, which is basically a, a construction of a structure that is based, as most said, and Zoe and everyone has said here, on, on the logic of exclusion. No? So, if we try to revert the logic of exclusion that we have been sort of condemned with since this inception of a new way of being an, a nation state um, to a logic of inclusion, then hopefully something can start changing, if we may. Okay. 
Um, a, lo a, a lot of things coming up here, but so what I hear you all saying in different ways is that this work of anti-racism or the work of, of uh, inclusion is the work of creating access, of creating spaces of comfort, that's your term, or spaces um, of identification, that's your term, right? And where one can, se can, can um, feel a sense of ownership. Um, at the same time, what is com keeps coming up here is also still the very strict geopolitical hierarchies that seem to be around and well, um, that are maybe even being reinstated uh, actively in the art world. Um, when I was preparing for this conversation, I was thinking of how this is a relatively recent conversation, a conversation of diversity, of inclusion, of access, of anti-racism. And had we been sitting here 10 years ago, we would probably be discussing the issue of globalization and globalizing collections or globalizing uh, you know, the exhibition practices, uh, because that was the buzzword 10 years ago. And while we're speaking about other things, we're speaking about access, we're speaking about social and racial justice, this issue of global hierarchy is still coming up, right? It, it seems to be alive and well. My question to you is, is this the same fight? Or are these two actually in competition? Like, is, and let me re rephrase so that I'm being clear, is this goal of being as global as possible from the perspective of a Western museum in New York or a museum, you know, in the global south in Buenos Aires, is this goal for globalizing and representation the same goal as the goal of social, race, uh, social justice and anti-racism? Or are they actually in competition and mutually exclusive? Am I being clear, or do I need to like? No, I, th I think you're clear. Yeah, okay, I perfect. Think clear. Um, I mean, so I started off with trying to present the idea of restorative justice, restorative justice, because I think restorative justice is um, it's one of the things we try to do in, in, in an American context, which is being exported as elsewhere. Uh, sort of this idea of diversity. You know, I mean, within the DEI, you have diversity, which is the, the optics of representation. That's the way I say it, you know. And it doesn't necessarily address um, um, the structures, uh, the protocols on which the structure is hinged. And I think that's where the work really needs to happen. Now, in the 90s, in the moment of globalization, I mean, one of the things, one of the arguments that was being made for globalization was that it would provide equal access, it will pr provide um, I mean, that was also the moment of celebrating multi multiculturalism and all of that, you know, that we're all on, th on this journey together. But at the same time, uh, there were still centers within that journey, within the art, uh, within the art world, you know, where, where those centers issue out the protocols that we are expected to abide with, you know. So even when we're all Happy Dovi, that we are in this uh, interesting journey together. We, we also had to go on that journey to set frameworks, you know, and those frameworks continue to determine the way in which we do the business we do today, even with um, this new age of deglobalization, which is what people are talking about, and um, that became, became quite uh, more, even more visible with uh, the pandemic, where people had to all run home to spaces that are safe and all of that. So, so there's restorative, restorative justice, which I think is a term that, that I am beginning to think about uh, more. But there's also the question of distributive justice, which is where I think equity comes in, that we're not doing much. Because with distributive justice is where you begin to talk about questions around fairness. You know, fairness in terms of how we think about the value system. Uh, fairness in the way we think about um, 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 the so-called hierarchy we continue to talk about, because fairness uh, allows one to think more critically about what equality means, rather than the way in which we try to perform those things uh, in the art world. You know, and this, I think, is where the real work uh, resides. And we're not doing enough with equity. We just, with the DEAI, it's something we, we, we say equity. But then I'm, I, I was just thinking about the way in which, um, I'll just read this out that the American Association of Museums sort of defined equity. And I thought it wasn't, it didn't go far enough, you know, and I'll just, tell, I'll just read that out. It says, um, 
the, the, the Alliance of American Museums, uh, which is sort of the umbrella body. It says, for example, the American Alliance of Museums defined equity as the fair and just treatment of all members of the community. Uh, it goes on to say that equity requires commitment to strategic priorities, resources, respect, and civility, as well as ongoing action and assessment of progress toward achieving specified goals. Now, what that definition fails to do is to fully unpack the how of those commitments, uh, which I think is left to individual institutions to sort of begin to think about. Um, also, the definition of equity does not address uh, what I call distributive justice um, uh, and, and the institu and institutional frameworks uh, that have been configured in, in certain ways. And so the point one makes is that equity requires revisiting um, the social ideas around uh, institutional structures that are often obscure when conversations focus mostly on diversity. Because I think that's where those protocols are hinged, you know, because those are constructs that we believe are set in stone. They have become entrenched. We don't engage with those uh, entrenched structures because we're more fo focused on performative diversity, you know. Uh, but diversity is not equity. And equity is where the work should happen. I'm not saying that diversity is wrong, but I think equity is really where, when you want to think about distributive justice, that is where the work should happen. That's a very interesting, I was listening to you smooth and I was thinking, wow, we are really in the opposite poles of power structures. <laughs> um, Directing a museum in Buenos Aires, which is a, I have to tell you, it's the best museum in the planet. So <laughs> uh, I'm so proud that I have to say it. I tell it to my staff every time, and when, I, when, when we travel, I, somebody travels, he's like, did you realize? Yes, a curator says, we are the best museum in the planet. I said, like, okay. <laughs> Anyway, but I was listening to you and I was, you know, thinking about the complexities and challenges of museums here in the United States, you know, and, and how different that situation is, for example, from our museum in Buenos Aires, where, where really um, globalization is not an issue at all. Like when, I have never, ever, ever thought of uh, thinking about our, of our collection in global terms. Yes, in terms of global relevance, that a collection of fantastic Argentine art is globally relevant and should be studied in depth for its own value. So our responsibility is really looking at equity, I would say, from within, um, but um, understanding uh, that equity in, in very complex terms of as to how a museum uh, can be at the true service of an artistic community, let's say, and, and to offer, to, to, to create the exhibitions and the programs and whatever we do inside or outside of the museum, thinking about, um, about our publics with with a specific also public in mind, which are the which is the artistic community per se. So, how you know to understand that it is a conversation that the museum brings to the floor every day, to society. Uh, so I think the um, um, there is a, a slight um, proposal of I wouldn't say polarization, but um, the global versus versus inclusion as something that, that could be different. And, and really, it's not a question in that sense, but a, a, rather a question about how, to, be, how to, to position the arts as relevant for society. And what is it that the artists uh, in Argentina specifically have to bring to the viewer when you were saying, Smooth, you want everybody to own your shows. and, and we at the museum, you know, have this um, ambition that an exhibition uh, visited by a child 
will will hopefully transform him or her life. And I know it looks very um, very daring to say this, but uh, it is a possibility to think of a, of another future and to to look. If you think that in a museum there are 300 or 400 artists on view, you are looking at 300 or 400 world views of people who take the time to think about how to be in the world in a different way and who put those ideas out through their art. So, you know, a class of 20 kids going to a museum with 400 artists, well, the good chances of touching a soul. <laughs> An idea has to spark. So, we look we are looking at very different sets of dynamics. Yeah. To respond to your question about globalism as a conversation in the 1990s, and is this current discussion about anti-racism a continuation, or is it a totally separate thing? I would say that it arises as a consequence um, of globalization. Um, if we look at the 1990s, that was the proliferation of the biennial. And today's mapping of the frenzy of the biennial model is incredible. Pretty much every country today has its own biennial platform. And in that growth of visibility that that model has given to the arts has come with a lot of disenfranchisement and prejudice. It takes money to start biennials. It takes certain access to certain forms of knowledge to be deemed good enough to curate a biennial. And what strikes me is the same dilemmas of access to museum practice and the right to display is somewhat being just exacerbated in that biennial model all over the world. And it strikes me that the, at least in, in my world, the biggest question of disjuncture is not necessarily firstly race, but faith. You'll have rooms where Brahmin will refuse to be in a room with Dalit from India. I'll find that there are certain indigenous peoples who refuse to be in settler gatherings. Uh, there'll be curators who want to work with certain ethnic minorities but don't understand the protocols they have to go through to access those ethnic minorities and so they therefore cause incredible offense and you find a polarization, polarization has started in the community because a foreign curator has entered without appropriate consideration. So sort of going off a little bit about what Vipash was talking in terms of cultural tourism, I would say that this frenzy of thinking the biennial model looks the same all over the world as a problem. And it, similar to the art fair model, it's easy to visit an art fair and visit a series of white booths, the same shape, the same size. He's an artist from Zurich, another artist from Lagos, next to someone from Ho Chi Minh. How many people actually understand the different contexts of artistic production that they're looking at? Do they understand that the artist in Ho Chi Minh is working next to a sewer plant that hasn't had any sense of attention for more than a decade and that's toxic? Where does the question marks concerning contexts of making become the responsibility of those who organize and consume? And in my mind, this question of anti-racism is just one tiny little conversation that is a part of a much bigger problem of extractivism and, dare I say, distributive justice. Just following you, sorry. Um, so um, as an independent, so uh, I also curated uh, an art fair, so uh, you know, a section in the art fair. 
and this is in uh, Dubai, 2023, so just many months ago. And then uh, it's a session called Bawapa. Uh, this is a session that want to represent 10 solo exhibitions of um, artists from the global south. So um, we, we had uh, the, the exhibitions, but then it, was, it has to be done through open call, which actually, that was when I realized like how the hierarchy of um, the art ecology in terms of you know the globalizations because globalization also mean a circulations of the money globally as well. Um, even though the artist was represented as you know like coming from the global south, but then the problems or the thing that was more visible for me was actually the gallery was not really from the global south. Uh, even though they are from the global south, myself as a curator, I had a hard time trying to get on board the galleries from uh, maybe maybe developing countries. So if for example, in Southeast Asia, I trying to get a gallery from, Mal uh, from Malaysia and try I was trying to get um, gallery from, from Myanmar inns, but then none of that has a mean to be at the fair. So we got, um, thankfully, but we got, you know, um, Gary that represented from Singapore, some of them coming from Paris. And then I think that um, show actually also something that we haven't seen, or is, is, you know, in terms of even though artists were representing somewhere, so the questions of, you know, the where, where uh, geographically the Gary is. And then whether it's possible, because um, when we end with that fair, on, with the fair, one of response that I had to the of, to to the organizer was that they have um, this this um, program to support uh, young Gary's. But then it would be great if they have uh, a program to support maybe Gary's from developing countries or underdeveloped countries. So we have more things that might end up in the museums. Variety and then all of that. So that's maybe something that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, uh, just a comment being um, not having experience in uh, curating exhibitions, but being a part of them, um, there's always the concern uh, of uh, homogenization of these works, especially being an artist that's from the Bahamas, from the Caribbean, how do we make efforts to, you know, to highlight the, or to celebrate the similarities, to bring these, uh, to bring them to light, but also to make the, to distinguish the very unique experiences of artists from, um, these different, from different uh, countries. Uh, I have the same considerations in my work as a person who represents black women. How do I maintain this, uh, the autonomy of the person represented? How do I maintain their unique identity while also I'm celebrating our overarching experiences, how we're interconnected? Um, so there's always a a balance to find, and it's always a, a consideration and a concern for me um, when thinking about my work in these contexts. Thank you. Um, it seems it's time to open it up to questions, and I want to start by asking if you have any questions to each other that you would like to ask. Okay, um, so let's open it to the questions from the audience. We have a mic that is going to be traveling, so please raise your hand if you have a question. Let's see if this works. Anybody? Uh, hello, uh, my name is Tenille Grant, and I just became the idea coordinator um, at the Carnegie Museum of Art and it's been great to listen to your perspectives and what you bring to the table as far as the discussion and how to um, be uncomfortable in places that now are opening their 
um, educational spaces to be more informal around how to come up with solutions. And so my question is, in this experience, and no one ever wants to really share the tough times, but if you'd like to and feel comfortable, what's the toughest moment in memory that's motivated you to come and speak and be a part of this work um, and um, continue to create teaching moments as you go along in your experience? Uh, my experience goes back to 2015 in Ho Chi Minh City. I'm carrying out a program called Conscious Realities, which is about bringing interdisciplinary thinking from across the Global South to spend time offline, in private, with a group of Vietnamese thinkers who are from a cross-section of creative and uh, various forms of applicability to the humanities and it was deliberately offline and invisible because the censorship wouldn't allow us to be public with the ideas that we're engaging. So this particular visit I invite Antoni Ajabe who is a really brilliant thinker from Douala, currently lives in Cape Town and um, he has this journal called Chimarenga where he thinks about how to conceive an Africa that embraces different kinds of empathic knowledge, emotional knowledge, fear, doubt. How do we map an Africa if we think about those as the compass points? And I wanted him to think about this with my crew from Vietnam who similarly suffer colonization that is untended, not discussed, not in the history books. And we found ourselves reading a Martinican thinker called Edouard Glissant who has these brilliant ideas about what it means to remain opaque, not understand it, not un, you know, how do we be honored to know that we can't be understood and that's okay. And we were reading in French and then English and then Vietnamese and then it was incredibly complicated for this crew of people trying to grasp philosophical concepts that are not a part of their educational system. Some broke down, some had arguments, some denied the fact translation can even possibly exist. And they started to get really angry with their Vietnamese. The language itself does lack a lot of words that can't immediately translate English terms. I found myself in a holy moly moment of what have I done? I've gone and disempowered my crew. I haven't exactly given them the space of agency to feel like knowledge is there for them. If they want it to be, what have I done? The savior to the moment was I'd had the foresight to ask Antone to bring his vinyl decks with him. He's a collector of Pan-African beat, and I'd miraculously found the money to get him to bring it to Saigon, and I'd found a dive bar on the port of Saigon where we went dancing three nights in a row, listening to Pan-African beat talk about revolutionary moments of opacity, which was the, the precise thing we were trying to understand philosophically. The brilliant thing, what I realized, is that learning isn't just textual, nor verbal. At the end of these three days, this crew understood that music has the ability to transmit histories, knowledge, and it isn't possible to understand the diverse amount of music that he played from across the African continent but it was possible to understand that these are peoples that they could have solidarity, if only they would study a little bit more. And so there was a sense of resilience and a glory in knowing the body can connect people. So I would say to your answer that that has uh, always resonated with me as a moment to show how culture can reveal itself in other sensorial ways. Would anybody else like to take that? Or should we ask for more questions? Yes. Thank you so much. And um, 
I really liked the way this conversation started breaking down this term anti-racism and in, in, it, in bringing the term of radical inclusion in. Um, I teach in the fashion department here, so I'm very aware of the presentation of inclusion or diversity. And my thoughts are, are kind of sinking into this gap between that presentation that we see institutionally and the position institutionally and the actions. Anti-racism was presented the fall of 2020 to this institution as an engaged position, one of action. So how does inclusivity as an action confront the frameworks um, that oppress the very idea of inclus inclusivity? So what I'm trying to say is it's very easy to present a position of inclusivity versus actually taking action. In an institution with limited classrooms, a finite um, semester of learning, um, I'm gonna stop there. For instance, if you have someone, if you include someone who might be a slower learner or a slower, slower maker, and you include them in the system, how do you confront that system that could actually work against them? Well, I'm from the educational you know, um, position as well, as a lecturer. But then um, one thing that I found very interesting, um, it's not from me, but then it's from my um, capoeira master. So I used to practice. Um, and then what, um, what he, he actually talked about was interesting because he was believed that um, the way that you can work inside the university, which I still use it, uh, uh, as a as a model was to be a termite. So you work around you work you 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 definitely work in the um, in the organizations, but then at the same time you you have a very subtle but you you play the long game and then you 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 know trying to work inside inside inside. It might take long. Uh, it might take um, maybe forever just you know to to um, not to change, but I guess like. Uh, make one building uh, tremble down or whatever. Uh, but then I think that idea, uh, the idea of being a termite was quite interesting in terms of thinking about engaging in uh, institutions internally, but then you don't say it to anybody that you are a termite, please. Yeah. Victoria, did you want to answer that as well? After the metaphor of the termite, I think I will never be able to su surpass it. <laughs> but I just want to say, just because you, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a university setting, but um, when you said you work in fashion, right? And immediately I, was, I looked at, at the survey that we did on racism in Argentina, and one of the components of discrimination is the way in which, in which we dress, right? So I think there's a lot to work on in regards to, to that possibility of thinking how, how can, can garments, um, how can new garments in the world propose other ways of thinking about a more equal world, I think there is a lot to work on that as well. I mean, I, I found your question um, interesting, but I was wondering um, whether the, the, the answer to the question shouldn't be, um, I mean, you're asking for actionable um, responses on the part of the institution itself. And one would wonder, 
uh, wouldn't there be a process in place by faculty as well to help make those actionable responses implementable in the long term for the students? Yes, that's where I actually feel I have that power is within my classroom. But the frameworks around uh, teaching and learning uh, often challenge my abilities. For instance, giving a student more time to learn or make um, is um, confined by the 15-week term in which I relinquish my power. And so I'm as an educator, I'm very interested in how this um, model of inclusivity or diversity um, plays out within these systems. So that's, I guess, I think the gap is in the classroom, actually. That that is where um, that faculty and students actually are engaging in these conversation and then the activity of teaching and learning. So I think I feel very lucky to be in that position because I'd rather be there than in an office. For you. But <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one more question. Yes, Jeff, here. First row. Hi, my name is Sabrina Griffin. And you know what brings me here is my love for museums. Ever since I was a little girl, I grew up in New York. Um, I've loved going to museums. I found it just a great space to learn about other people, places, and things, and culture. Um, I wanted to respond. My professional background um, um, is as a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant in corporate. So that's why I really wanted to piggyback on um, the professor's um, comment. So thinking about what has happened in Colbert, thinking about what has happened you know, since uh, the summer of reckoning of the murders of uh, George Floyd in 2020 and others, there's been a lot of pushback. First, there was a lot of interest in inclusion social justice, equity, all the different names. And so with, and now there's some backlash. There's been some resistance. And so my question for you, particularly those of you who are, who are curators and at institutions, how do you sustain the work? How do you deal with any resistance to the work? How do you continue to make your institutions and your artwork is a, accessible, inclusive, in whatever terms you want to use, so that everybody feels welcomed and valued and respected. I cannot resist trying to answer your question. Um, well, first, thank you for the job you do. <laughs> The world has to say thank you. Um, I think it's a, it's a path that uh, once you recognize the importance, you cannot, there's no possibility of deviating. This is my personal um, perspective. For, for us, um, Tomorrow morning, I'm going to give a talk about what we do at the museum. And if you would like to come, I would be very honored. Um, but for us, uh, during the, pan the pan what, what the pandemic meant, I'm going to be very brief on this. Um, I, I arrived to a museum that, that was empty, let's say. And I worked during my first five years to create the museum of my dreams as a director for our society, pretty close. <laughs> and then the pandemic came and I realized when the museum, the, sh the doors shut, I realized everything that this museum and my staff would do every day that nobody noticed. 
It was totally invisible work. Social work out there, the museum, in the hospitals, in the schools, in the streets, in the very low income neighborhoods. Incredible work. I would look at our website, not to be found, all the education work, not to, I was like, oh my God, like, we have to, we have to put the value on this that we already do. And well, the exhibitions are closed. Of course, it's not good for the artists. They will reopen at some point. But now the importance is this, and to make that work visible and hopefully to, to transmit a message in Argentina that, you know, this is a bit utopic, sorry, but if, if we could invite other museums to follow the trend, <laughs> let's say, then there could be a transformation of society. So we started to work maniacally to put this out there and to multiply the efforts and to realize that whatever, the, the museum as a gallery was closed, but the activity was as, became as large as, e as ever before. And once we went into that path of multiplying the social work, the engagement work, the inclusion work, we had been showing few artists a year and suddenly it was hundreds of artists in the galleries and all over our programs. You cannot go back. <laughs> you cannot go back. Say, okay, this is, now we have to learn how to be another museum, which I ho I'm hoping it's a better engine, not I don't know if it's a place, but so that's how I try to think about it. Sorry, I'll, I'll just um, quickly chime in um, on two fronts. Yes, uh, George Floyd happened in the US and elsewhere in the world. Uh, museums, there was, a certain, there was a certain urgency by institutions to to try to do the right thing in response to that. Um, and the reality is that it's, it's a, you, which anyone who's a good forecaster would see, that after a moment it's gonna, it's gonna sort of better out. Uh, but I think the work that happened in that moment of urgency uh, is a very critical work that will continue to inform the, the museums going forward. I'm not saying this as someone trying to hold the brief for the museum, but I, I'm, I speak as someone who knows that little drops ultimately make uh, more difference than, 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 than the idea of the radical that can be one of, you know. And so, but I see the idea of the radical happening in that moment of George Floyd. But now this, the work of sustaining that uh, would now take different pathways. And I think, I don't wanna speak for my institution because I'm not here as my institution, but I think uh, the, the work continues, but not with that level of urgency um, uh, at, in that moment. You know? And th th there are several reasons for someone who, if, if you're paying attention to the economics, you know, um, you realize that the, the institutions and the world follow, follow the economics. So what followed pandemic was high inflation, you know? So everyone's attention suddenly gravitates to what to do with inflation, you know? High mortgage rate, da da da, da da da, da da da. And you win some to lose some, you know? But I think the, the larger goal to keep in mind is that um, what happened at that critical moment is not something that will easily um, vanish. That it's changed institutions in ways that is unimaginable, you know, because you continue to see um, um, how it's been made, um, not at the same level as, as, it, as it, it was done during the pandemic, but how has continued to happen. And those highest bring with them um, ruptures in the, in, in the way in which the institutions um, uh, do their business, and those ruptures will, so far those hires remain in those institutions and contribute those pockets of um, change. Ultimately, uh, the agglomeration of those pockets 
will transform institutions. That's sort of how I see some of those things. I think that's maybe a good place to land on the hope for change from small pockets and termites inside institutions. Thank you all so much for sharing your wisdom with us and thank you all for attending.